Greetings, welcome back everyone. Happy Monday. Hope everyone is doing okay. Today we're talking about expressionism in Germany mostly, but also Austria. And this is um, a really ripe period of experimentation and very influential as well. I decided to again post the questions in advance so that way you don't have to flip back and forth so you can screenshot these or jot them down if you want to pause this. Hopefully the first question isn't blocked, but if it is, it says, what does Paula Melderson Becker do first? Question mark. Um, second question, what does Der Bruch mean? And what does the name come from? So if you want to pause these, write these down. Uh, these will also be on the assignment for you to respond to this lecture. So the first artist that we're going to talk about that is really an entry level into Germany uh, and German Expressionism is Paula Mauderson Becker. She is a artist working in the late 19th, early 20th century, and she unfortunately dies at a really young age. You can see a sense of Van Gogh and Gauguin in her work, a sense of symbolism, but something a little bit different starts to happen in Germany. And just like Gauguin, who had moved from the city of Paris and got away first in Brittany and then later in Tahiti, Paula, Paula Motorsen Becker did the same thing and she moved to this uh, folk village that was kind of outside of society. A lot of other artists settled in there and created an artist colony to kind of get away from the hustle and bustle of the city and to return to a more simple lifestyle. This is a really interesting painting, very, very beautiful. I think you can see some comparisons to Van Gogh, to Gauguin, like I mentioned, but also Gustav Klimt, who again, we talked about last time, who was an artist that worked in um, first in Paris and then later in uh, Germany where his show was um, cut down early. Uh, but was very inspirational to a lot of other artists. And so here we see her work and a very interesting subject matter and a very German uh, style of painting that becomes German Expressionism. But this is kind of proto-German um, German Expressionism. This is the first known female nude painted self-portrait. So think about that. Remember we talked about the difference between Mary Cassatt painting or drawing or doing a print of a female bather and how that might be different than Degas doing the female bather or even a depiction by Manet like Olympia. Well, so this is not only a woman painting a woman, but it's painting herself. So one term that I like to use a lot is, is self-fashioning, right? Um, so thinking about not only the person that's depicting someone, but the, the subject matter, the person who's sitting for a portrait and how they choose to stand or pose, right? When we know a photograph is about to be taken of us, we, we, we want to flatter ourselves or we think we have a, you know, here's my best side, don't shoot this side, that sort of thing. So we, kind of, we talk about that as being self-fashioning, how the subject matter chooses to pose when a painting or a photograph is taken. Now when you're doing a self-portrait, just like Van Gogh, think about how much control you would have over that. But also the vulnerability of herself painting herself nude, so she's the subject matter, but she's also controlling. How does she paint herself? As sort of a powerful female icon. You know, she's nude, but she has the necklace on, so her breasts are exposed, but she's still highlighting her femininity, but also her power, and she's highlighting her stomach um, because she's pregnant. Um, so this is the self-portrait on her sixth wedding anniversary. Paula Motorson Becker is a very important artist, but an artist that unfortunately died very young. It'd be interesting to see what she had, uh, would have been able to do if she had lived longer. She actually died giving birth, uh, not long after giving birth to one of her children. Um, we can see a unique German nationalism, all right? So part of German expressionism is inspired by this new civic national pride. And Germany is relatively new. If you think about in the um, 1870s, um, you know, kind of getting unified 
And so some of these artists are responding to that nationalism, that in a way, the things that happened in Germany, like this artist that was part of Romanticism, Caspar David Friedrich, as being uniquely German. So a lot of the German expressionist artists that we'll talk about today uh, are exploring their German heritage or in some way saying how Germany is unique. And if you look at German Romanticism, like Caspar David Friedrich, who ha happens in early in the 19th century, <clears throat> is he's really looking at emotion, nature and emotion. And that's really a lot of what German Expressionism is as well. So she died 18 days after giving birth. This is her, a photograph of her with her child right before she passed away, her daughter. Uh, and, you know, we can see the, the resemblance here. I think this is just a really beautiful self-portrait, very lovingly painted. Um, and she did a lot of self-portraits. Here she is again holding these flowers. I think, you know, if you think about the symbolism as uh, a flower representing femininity, but also in some ways sexuality, here we can see this beautiful self-portrait that Paula Modersen Becker did on the right. And now there is a film about her life because I think she's a really important, influential artist that inspires a lot of what comes after her in Germany, but she's not necessarily a household name, which I think is unfortunate. I think more people should be aware of her life, her work, and her contribution. And there's actually, in Bremen, in Germany, there is a museum that's dedicated to just her work. So she was, um, you know, she was born in Dresden. A lot of these artists started in Dresden as well. She was born in Dresden, then went to that artist colony, which is near Bremen. I have a very good friend who lives in Bremen in Germany, and um, it's further north. And so if you ever wanted to see a lot of her works, there's the Bremen Museum in Germany that, uh, that focuses on uh, Paula Modersen Becker's work. Um, beautiful piece, really interesting and very influential, sort of a foundational figure in terms of what happens in German Expressionism. The uh, Another figure who is very important, very innovative and influential is this artist, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. And Kirchner is uh, an early German Expressionist and he co-founded this art group called Die Brücke. And Die Brücke means the bridge. And it comes from a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche was famous for his idea of as existentialism or nihilism, you know, kind of at the turn of the century, remember we talked about this, um, you know, either taking a positivism view uh, or being kind of a negative view of von de Siecle. And um, Nietzsche was one who talked about, you know, he was very famous for his quote, God is dead, which I think has been misaligned in a lot of different ways. But what basically what he was saying is, uh, and with existentialism is if you don't have a particular religion, what controls your morality? So it's not necessarily an amorality or not having a religion. It's basically saying, you know, how can we create a system of rules, laws, if it's not this, you know, you think about um, different governments at the time, some could become corrupt, you had different revolutions. So who is the ultimate say on what morality is? The state, the religion, the church, and all of these can become corrupted. People can become corrupted. And then with the wars, World War I, World War II, in Germany and other places, there was a lot of skepticism, right? And so these artists were working against kind of, you know, using ideas from nature, working against what's happening in society, and building on the ideas of Friedrich Nietzsche and others. So, Die Brücke means the bridge, and it actually comes from this quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, from his text Übermensch, which Übermensch means sort of like Superman or Supermen, uh, this idea that no one can build you the bridge on which you and only you must cross the river of life. Uh, there may be countless trails and bridges and demigods who would gladly carry you across, but only at the price of pawning and foregoing yourself. So an idea of new men or supermen, Friedrich Nietzsche was saying that um, you have to be heroic. You have to take things on yourself. And this inspired Kirshner and others. So this is a movement first that started in Dresden. In Dresden is a city in Germany. And um, it then moves to Berlin. So Die Brücke is founded in Dresden, moves to Berlin, and one of the founding figures is this uh, painter Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. 
He was also trained as an architect. And it's interesting because a lot of these artists that we're going to talk about today, there's a great connection between art and architecture, specifically at the turn of the century in Germany, which later influences Bauhaus, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. Um, he studied at the Dresden Academy. We could not have German expressionism and German expression expressionism become so popular uh, worldwide, globally, influences a lot of modern art and contemporary art to this day. We wouldn't have it if it weren't for Kirshner and starting this group called The Bridge. Uh, so he is one of three main figures that we'll talk about today that's part of Die Brücke, and they become very foundational for later what is German expressionism. Let's look at this painting a little bit. At the center of this painting, we see a very chaotic scene. In the back, we see a streetcar that's driving away from us. We see a huge, just mass of people, a huge crowd. And this kind of looks like, remember Munch's The Bridge, um, the, the scene, the scream. This is kind of like that as well. It's the sense that society is in a way here to harm us. This, do, these don't look like friendly faces. And remember the face in Toulouse-Lautrec's Moulin Rouge? Here we see it again uh, in Kirshner's work as a way of saying like all of these figures are foreboding and scary. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting painting. And at, at its center, one of the models here is um, a figure that he'll return to quite a bit, one of his models here um, uh, that we'll talk about in a bit. There's a sense of reality, but then there's also a sense of color separate from local color and color that's just much more symbolic, like Fauvism, like Matisse. And these artists would have been familiar with what Matisse did and others in the Fauvist movement. So Kirchner is very important in German Expressionism. That child that was, was at the center of that composition is repeated here. Um, this is called Seated Girl. Franzi Fehrman. Uh, this is really interesting because um, Franzi and her sister basically become the face of German Expressionism and Der Bruck. A lot of these Der Bruck artists used this girl as a model and also her sister. And um, they came from a family that was um, well-to-do, but uh, the mother had an illicit affair and had children out of wedlock and later she becomes a, a circus performer. Her parents die. Well, actually, she never really was associated with her real dad or her adopted father. Her mother passes away, and these two girls were seen as kind of like rowdy, not good girls. They were bad. They were, they were like um, interesting. They were also street performers and, and in circus. Uh, this, was, this was not only Kirshner's muse, at the time, she's probably like 12 or 13 years old, and she becomes a model that a lot of the German Expressionist artists use. It looks kind of like that Matisse portrait, the green line of Madame Matisse, um, but uh, her whole face becomes green. Really interesting. It's like another persona that she can wear. There's this figure here. Kirchner, uh, first in Dresden and later in Berlin, starts to see a lot of African art and gets influenced by that. So we can see that influence as well. And Kirchner and others said that there was a certain kind of spontaneity and naive, um, naivety, uh, naivety or na you know, naiveness about the African work that um, art history and kind of the academic tradition ignores, right, to kind of get this refined uh image of a person in a painting or a sculpture looking just like the source or the subject matter, there's a certain amount of expressiveness or emotion that Kirshner and others saw in those African objects. I put an article in uh, Schoology that talks about how African art and one particular object actually changes the history of, of, of art uh, by because Matisse collected a sculpture and influenced a lot of his work. Check that out. I think it's an interesting read. And it talks about how Matisse, Picasso, and others like Kirshner were influenced by African art. That at the first time was starting to, because of colonialism, unfortunately, was starting to be collected and shown in first ethnographic museums and then later in art museums. Um, I want to talk a little bit today also about how the war, World War I, World War II, affected 
uh, and also Nazism affected some of these artists and how a lot of them died or how a lot of them stopped making work because I think the story mostly of German Expressionism is an unfortunate story, a really um, harsh story of artists that had difficult lives. Uh, a lot of their lives were marred by tragedy and conflict and turmoil because of the wars, but also because of the rise of Nazism. So as an example, Kirshner died by suicide. Um, he killed himself. And um, I think it's emblematic of a lot of um, the artist. He actually, um, you know, was an artist that was labeled a degenerate artist, which we'll talk more about by Hitler and others. Uh, and so these artists had to flee for their lives um, because of uh, Hitler's ideas of what acceptable art was and what bad art was. Also, last time we talked about Munch and doing those woodcuts and how there was a revival of woodcuts. Munch was very influential in these German expressionist artists. And um, so we can see uh, how his work influences the German Expressionists. So here is an example of Munch's combination print here. And, um, you know, you think about Munch and his work, you know, he's Scandinavian um, from Norway, but then later moves to first Paris, France, and then to um, Berlin. So he influences these German expressions. In a way, Fran um, Munch becomes a German expressionist or becomes really revered by those German expressionist artists. So there becomes this huge revival of woodcuts in Germany at the turn of the century. And here's an example of um, Kirchner taking a, a, a page out of Munch's book and using the rough, raw quality of wood. He liked to see the wood grain. He really roughly cut. You can even see the gouge marks. A lot of times in art history, in woodcut, the artist would get rid of these gouge marks, those kind of incidental textural marks that are in between the design. He left them, and other artists left them as well. They liked the rough quality, the spontaneity that you could get, kind of the primitivism or the look of, in a sense, African art, and they're mimicking that in a new mode of a uh, new way of using printmaking. Um, so this is still part of Der Bruck. And this is um, actually a, photo, uh, a portrait of Henry Vandeveld, who was a Belgian Art Nouveau architect. We talked about Art Nouveau last time. This isn't in the book, but I love this. This is from his portfolio called Der Bruck. So not only did he use that terminology for his group that he formed of artists, but he also used it in his artwork. Uh, and this is a beautiful print. I really like this because he designs the image and it's a really clever use of black and white space. So in some cases, the dancers in the background are white on black. And then here it's more black on white. Great use of positive and negative space and kind of thinking about the design of the composition and using that rough quality, not making fine detail like some artists would with printmaking, but leaving the roughness and the spontaneity of the wood. Another artist that's part of De Bruck is Emile Nolde. It's interesting, Emile Nolde um, was uh, a, from a remote area in Germany, uh, northwestern Germany, that was um, a kind of ger German spirit that was longing for a simpler time, and they were reacting to or responding to the Industrial Revolution in Germany and wanted to keep, preserve their folk style. Volkisch means folk. Like even think of the word um, Volkswagen means the folks wagon or the folks car, which Hitler designed the first Volkswagen Beetle. Did you know that? That's a kind of a uh, notorious or auspicious beginning. Uh, but folkish means folk. And so you have this region in Germany that already has a dedication to simpler life. So instead of Paula Motorson Becker having to move and go find this place, that's literally where Emil Nolde came from. And in the tradition of Da Vinci, um, you know, Leonardo Da Vinci, his last name isn't Da Vinci, he's from Vinci, so Leonardo from Vinci. Same idea, Emil Nolde's real name is Emil Hansen, but in that tradition of Leonardo da Vinci, he adopted his hometown's la uh, name as his last name, so his moniker becomes Emil Nolde. His real name is Emil 
uh, Hansen. So here we see another De Bruck artist that's really interested in um, emotion and rough style of paint. So first of all, I want you to think about German expressionism. It's, it's expressionistic for two reasons. You can think about artists making, you know, thick, very tactile brush strokes, roughly applied paint in a kind of quick expressionistic way. But you can also think of expressionism as being like emotional. So it's kind of that duality of it's both painted in an expressionistic manner, uh, similar to impressionism, but also the emotional, the raw, natural, emotional quality represents expressionism as well. This was influenced by James Enser, the Belgian artist that also had some of his work shown in Berlin. Uh, you can see the kind of the sense of the masks, but instead of the masks looking like masks here, they kind of explore the different personas or personalities of each of the people in The Last Supper. So instead of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, which is, you know, arranged in a very neat and orderly way on the table, they're all on one side. Here we see The Last Supper in this really dense, chaotic, claustrophobic, compressed type space all 12 apostles surrounding Christ for the Last Supper here. And a lot of, Emil Nolde was an interesting figure. He did a lot of landscape, a lot of seascape, and a lot of religious portraits. And it's interesting because if you look at what woodcut could do, uh, I really like in the German expressionist paintings to kind of having that same quality. They feel like they're cut. They feel like they're carved. They look wooden, uh, kind of similar to the woodcuts. Emil Nolde is one of the very few artists during this period that lives a very long life. He lived very uh, long, uh, you know, most of the artists died kind of tragically. He, he lived a much longer life and produced a lot of works. And a lot of the artists had to choose. They had to decide, are they going to fight with the Nazis? Which in the case of Emil Nolde, unfortunately he did. But later he completely disavowed his Nazi roots. And so uh, at making work in the 1940s and the 1950s, um, he said that he was really conscripted or forced to become a Nazi, which isn't entirely, he kind of rewrote his biography in a sense. It's a, it's a fiction because he willingly, he volunteered to fight for the German army on the side of Hitler and Nazis. So first in World War I and later in World War II, he becomes a Nazi. Um, and uh, later then disavowed that, but obviously after Nazis lose World War II, he didn't have much of a choice. So there's unfortunately this history of fascism that's equated with his work that Kirshner uh, and others don't do because Kirshner was definitely against Hitler and was labeled a degenerate artist. Hitler did not like Emil Nolde's work, but because he became a Nazi and a Nazi sympathizer, he was allowed to continue to um, live, but not necessarily make work that looked like this anymore, which is interesting. So um, the next artist that we're going to talk about is um, Eric Heckel. And Heckel is also um, one of Der Bruck, one of the bridge artists. And this is Franzi Fairman again, which again, remember, she's as much, it's a, the, um, Der Bruck is as much about her as it is about the artist because she becomes a model uh, for them. And here again, she's this kind of uh, young adolescent child, but shown nude, not, ne not necessarily sexualized, but in a way kind of showing the idea of innocence and how society can corrupt that innocence. And I love her eyebrows. They, they look like um, sub-Saharan African art. So you can definitely see the African influence. And you can also see the influence of Edward Munch and his puzzle print method, which I told you guys about before, where instead of having a green block and a red block, what he did was he would take one block, carve it, and then literally cut that block into sections. So you'd have the top, the middle, and then you could ink them up separately, do the top part red, middle part green, and then put them back together like a puzzle, run it through the press, so you get multiple colors in one shot. And Heckel copied this method from Munch, which um, you know a lot of the artists did. Uh, and you can see a sort of innocence, but also expressiveness, an emotional quality in this. It's almost making her kind of look like Eve, from like Adam and Eve, which also has 
a great German connection as well. If you think about Emil Nolde copying artists like Albrecht Durer, and Albrecht Durer was really, um, you know, uh, interested in the idea of kind of the Old Testament of the Bible and the apocalyptic parts, and some of the German expressionists picked up on that as well. Um, another artist, Max Pexton, part of um, Der Bruch, studied the Dresden Academy, just like Kircher did, and he was also influenced by oceanic art similar to Gauguin. And here we can see, kind of like Fauvism, a sense of color and exotic uh, art as well. Um, these artists were starting to get work from other places because of the spread of colonialism. This is an artist here too as well, um, interesting because he, um, he had been part of um, the Nazis. He was asked to create, he helped redesign the German eagle that was used as part of the flag, um, but later Nazis confiscated his work. They didn't realize the, the abstract kind of style of paintings that he made, and this particular painting was confiscated by the Nazis. It's now in a museum in Berlin. Bold self-portrait, again, trying to make painting look more like woodcut or graphic art, where it's hard to tell the difference between a painting and a woodcut, kind of giving that rough, expressionistic, quick um, style. So here we see on the left, isn't that interesting? That's Carl Schmidt Rotloff and his logo that he designed for um, the German Nazi uh, uh Originally, just for Germany, later co-opted by um, the, the Nazis and then later changed again. So, uh, interesting connection to Nazism there. The next art movement that we're going to talk about that's part of German Expressionism is called Der Blue Reiter. And Der Blue Reiter starts with this artist, Kandinsky, and his um, fiancé. They started this group called the Blue Rider. So their Blue Rider literally means the Blue Rider, like horseback rider. And Kandinsky is a Russian artist. He's from Moscow, but he emigrates to Germany. Uh, and then at the rise of World War II, he moved back to um, Russia because of the conflict, because of the war. We'll talk about his work again later in the semester. But it's interesting because Kandinsky, for the longest time, has been considered the first artist to really explore abstraction. And we see this first image here, which still looks like naturalism or objective art because you can see figures in it, such as this, such as this here, and a sense of the landscape. But one day, the story goes that he went into his studio and he had one of his paintings flipped on its side and he was really confused. He's like, this looks like an image, but I can't tell what the image is. And it was like an epiphany for him. At that point, he started to strip art from its objectiveness and made it more subjective. So it didn't have to look like figures or forests or horses. It just became purely abstract. So originally from Moscow, moved to Paris and then later moved to Munich. Der Blue Rider is mostly a group of artists in Munich. So where Der Bruch or the bridge started in Dresden and moved to Berlin, the Blue Rider is mostly in Munich. And it's um, co-founded by Kandinsky and his fiance, never his wife, Gabriela Munter, which we'll talk to talk about. So Kandinsky becomes kind of the first to abstraction. Around the same time, Brancusi is exploring pure form. And there's this kind of spiritualism and folklore. A lot of artists and a lot of uh, people during this time are moving away from traditional religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity. And as they learn about other Christ, uh, uh, religions outside of the Christian faith, they start to create these new kind of interests and um, study of the sense of spirituality devoid of religion. And one in particular is called um, Theosophy. So Kandinsky was interested in spiritism and also Theosophy, which is kind of like theories of religion separate from kind of like taking some metaphysical aspects from Jewish tradition, combining elements of Buddhism, Hinduism, and mysticism. 
So this idea that you can kind of seek a more clear understand of spirituality or another plane devoid from religious dogma. And you can see that in his work. Also, um, it's interesting, his uh, fiance, G Gabriela uh, Munter, studied a type of painting called Hinter glass malari which means painting behind glass you could put them on on lamps so in other words what you would do is you'd paint in kind of reverse you paint the things first on the glass that were closest to uh the person looking at them and then later the furthest away layers were painted last and um, what it did is exaggerate the sense of space and Munter's work was inspired by that process because she started that first and then she on glass and then later kind of translated it to canvas. And she taught Kandinsky that method as well. And so he mimicked that in his work. It was a way of kind of abstracting the form. But above all, his work is ultimately about music. He knew artists, he knew musicians like Schoenberg and others and thinking about ways of um, picturing what music could look like or would look like. And it's interesting, some people theorize that Kandinsky perhaps had synesthesia, right? You know what synesthesia is? Maybe someone has synesthesia or you know someone that has it. It's where, where two of your senses are mixed, like the movie Fantasia by Disney, where someone might smell uh, sounds or they might have an a hearing association with letters or colors associated with letters. And so he's kind of mixing different senses together. And a lot of his paintings are called improvisation or composition, just like music. And he's thinking about harmony and notes when he creates his compositions. Really beautiful work. We'll study Kandinsky again. This is his early work. We'll study his later work again in a later chapter. This is his fiance. They were engaged. They were never married. Really interesting story about Gabriela Munter and Kandinsky similar to how we think about the artist couple of Auguste Rodin and Camille Claudel, um, that they were an artist couple working together. Gabriella Munter was very influential in Kandinsky's work, and I don't think she gets enough credit. Kandinsky, to this day, very, very famous artist, but Gabriella Munter was very influential. So um, Kandinsky, from Russia originally, he was married to a Russian woman. He moved to Paris, then he, then he moved to Munich. He met Gabriella Munter and he promised her, I can't divorce my wife now because I'm living in Germany. She's living in Russia, but eventually I'm going to divorce her and I will marry you. Well, at the onset of World War I, he had to move back to Russia. He did divorce his wife, but he remarried another Russian woman. This made Gabriella Munter understandably very, very accepted. Uh, um, um, upset and even though she still loved him she never forgave him for that but she kept all of his works and it's the reason why a lot of Kandinsky works still exist to this day because Gabriela Munter hid them from the Nazis he was a labeled a degenerate artist in World War II she saved his work she hid him in her basement was able to protect protect them first from the Germans, later the Russians who wanted to find those works and said, Kandinsky is an important Russian artist. We want these works to come back to Russia. They probably would have been destroyed by Germans. They might have been destroyed by Russians. They exist today. Uh, and a lot of them you can go see in Munich in Lenbach House, where this particular print is by Gabriela Munter because she saved them. I think most people would have been so pissed at them. She probably would have destroyed them or said, hey, Nazis, come get them. Hitler, you think they're degenerate? Go ahead and ruin them because I want to kill this guy. He said he was going to marry me and he didn't. Married someone else, but she still protected his works and others, hers as well. So um, the Nazis wanted to confiscate this to destroy the works or to sell them. They were selling works by Van Gogh, Gauguin, uh, some of the uh, artists they lab labeled degenerates like Kirshner and Kandinsky, they would steal them, sell them, and buy things like tanks with them or, or destroy them. They burned and destroyed a lot of works. So she was first a study, uh, a student of Kandinsky. She studied at the school that Kandinsky and others had created called Phalanx Academy, P-H-A-L-A-N-X, which is like a military lineup. It's a, a grouping of people. 
Uh, and so she studied first with Kandinsky and then later was his, um, his partner. Uh, and she was very, very influential in her, her, his work. And you can see the sense of monk woodcut, that puzzle cut method. And one of the cool things about woodcut is you can change the colors. This is something that later influences an artist like Andy Warhol and his portrait of Marilyn Monroe, where you can change the colors. And here we see Munch with that puzzle cut method. You can see this was one block. And normally, instead of inking it all up one color, like black, and then having to carve another block to be blue or red, you can see exactly how he did this. He cut these figures out. So these figures would have been separate. Here, this woman is part of the blue. Here, the man is part of the black. And he used this puzzle cut like with a jeweler saw to cut the black apart so he could ink the blue part up separate from the black part, put them back together like a puzzle on the press, run it through, uh, and, and it was really inspirational and influential. This is an example of Gabriela Munter's um, painting, and it's a, a portrait of two other artists that are associated with their Blue Rider, uh, but it, it shows her style of hinterglas malory, which means painting behind glass, uh, she translated that to doing it on, in this case, cardboard or canvas or um, wood uh, to get a kind of a new style of painting. Even though it's kind of abstracted, it's still objective and it's still, you can tell it's the two people with the band background, has an influence of, say, Lunch on the Grass by Manet, a sense of Van Gogh. She thought Van Gogh was one of the best artists because he was a, a, an artist that used color imaginatively but still objectively which you can see green grass blue sky uh, it makes sense and it wasn't completely stripping it of its meaning so Gabriela Munter very important artist doesn't get as much credit as she should deserve with being very very influential another of the um, dare blue rider artists and a lot of times becomes synonymous with the blue rider is Franz Mark if you think about a blue rider, it means like blue horseback rider. And what does Franz Mark use as a subject matter? Blue horses. Um, also working in Munich, Franz Mark tragically had a really, really short life. He didn't live very long. He actually died in World War I, so didn't get a chance for to, to have uh, to live up to the fame that he later accomplishes, but also avoids uh, the labeling of his work being degenerate by Hitler and others. So in some ways he spared kind of the mockery of what some of the artists went through. But unfortunately, we're left with very few works by Franz Mark because his life was cut so tragically short. Let's see, he was 36 when he died. 1911, this painting is um, about five years before he passed away in 1916 during World War I. Der Blue Rider, you can see a sense of spiritualism, folkism, German nationalism, proud to be German. The horses kind of make sense once you know there's horses there, but if you don't know there's horses there, this becomes abstract, similar to Kandinsky. And why blue horses? That doesn't even make sense, but it's sort of like symbolism, like Kirschner and Der Blue where it's like the color can do something different than what you would expect it to do. And there's a certain kind of innocence about these horses. It kind of reminds me of romanticism when we saw the work of George Stubbs, where the horses be kind of become proxies for humans. And I see that as well in Franz Mark's work. If you're thinking about, wouldn't it be nice if we could escape the reality of civilization well, what better a metaphor than a horse, right? The sense of freedom and not being able to be, you know, tamed. They're not being ridden. They're just out there in the wild doing their thing. And wouldn't that be a great way if we could live that way? So uh, a sense of symbolism. Majority of his work were blue horses. He was really good friends with this other artist, August Mackay. And Mackay also had symbolic uses of color, rough expressionistic uses of colors. And he did a lot of, um, in the book they show a different example, a, a zoological garden. But I love, he's much more famous for his window scenes of women shopping in windows. And you see these fancy hats that she's looking at. This almost becomes this kind of fractal cubist portrait here 
Um, but August Mac and uh, Franz Mark were both part of Der Blue Writer and used colorful in a really bold, expressionistic way. Uh, again, another example of an artist died young, 1914, as a soldier in World War I. What would have happened? What would have their work looked like after the rise of Picasso? What would their work changed and looked like considering what Cubism did or later um, Surrealism? Dadaism. Uh, these are, in Germany, art movements that the young artists, when they become old artists, start to be influenced by artists like Salvador Dali. What would have happened? It's just such a tragedy to think that a young artist like this that had a brilliant career ahead of him, similar to Franz Marc, there's just a finite period of time that they existed on this earth. In only a short period, they were able to create beautiful masterpieces. What else could they have done? It's just really, really unfortunate. Um, one last artist to talk about um, that is part of their Blue Writer is the artist Paul Clay. Paul Clay is actually a Swiss artist who moves to Munich. He's later associated with Bauhaus. We'll talk about Bauhaus as being this really important German school right around the time after World War I. Uh, during World War II, it gets shut down by uh, Nazis. Uh, by Hitler, um, but he starts as part of this loose affiliation artist, friends with Kandinsky and Gabriela Munter, and his work um, was uh, inspired by medieval art as well, which we see in some of the German Expressionists, and also artists like Seurat and Van Gogh. And this is him going to uh, North Africa. He went to Tunisia with uh, his friend, the artist August Mackey, he was friends with August Mackey and Franz Marc, and he did this little study, this landscape, while he was there. His, a lot of his work would be graphic looking. He wanted them to look like prints, so instead of watercolor having to look super representational and naturalistic, here it looks a little bit more like just a graphic print. And this is of a mosque in Hamamat, which is a city in North Africa in Tunisia. So this was based on his travels there and thinking about how that place was so colorful and inspirational. Paul Clay is such an interesting and innovative artist, one of the most varied and influential. He had a wide, huge body of work, representational, realistic, cubist, childlike drawings, uh, really interesting graphic works, uh, abstract works all over the place, but, you know, created a large body of work over the course of his career. Um, very fertile career as well. So, and we'll talk about his association with Bauhaus as well. Um, the next group that we'll talk about, this is an independent artist. So this is an artist that isn't part of Der Bruck or Der um, Blue Rider. It is the artist Ernst Barlock. How did the artist Paul Clay die? Uh, he, def he died of sort of natural causes in 1940, but a lot of times these artists who died of natural causes um, probably were hastened by the fact that it was difficult for them to make work. Paul Clay had to flee. He left Berlin, went back to Switzerland, lived in London during the war. So some of these artists that died of natural causes probably got really, really unhealthy. He died of a, a form of sclerosis, um, probably because of the rise of Nazism. And, he, you know, they shut down the school that Paul Clay had been teaching at. He had to flee for his life, moved to Switzerland, and later lived in London. A lot of artists moved to the United States if they could, uh, because they fled, um, they, they feared for their lives. Actually, Hitler did put in concentration camps some of these artists. Ernst Barlock was another example of an artist who probably died as a result of being told he could no longer make art. He was part of a sculpture guild, and in Germany, the state controlled who made sculptures and who didn't, because think about it, these materials are expensive. A lot of artists can't afford bronze, so someone else has to pay for the material. So this is an independent artist, Ernst Barlock, who's working in Germany. Um, Adolf Hitler labels him a 
uh, degenerate. He has to be stripped of his ability to make art. He loses his sculpture guild license, so no one's going to pay for him to make materials. Um, he does some prints, but basically, you know, he has a heart attack, dies of a heart attack uh, at a fairly young age because 1938, he didn't like what was happening in his country and he couldn't make art anymore. It's like, what was his tool for survival? But his work is beautiful. It's really interesting. A lot of his work was about Germany and Germany's role in World War One. He was socially very conscious. He was thinking about what happens to the soldiers when they return after World War One, World War Two. Why are all these people dying? Um, what are they dying for? He was also a poet. He was also um, a director of plays, wrote plays, a printmaker, a sculptor, and his work is really, really beautiful. It's so different than anything at the time. It's both graceful and also stiff at the same time. It's like kind of a sense of movement and fluidity. But the, the way that the different kind of facets look very angular and planar, doing something different. And he was really inspired by medieval sculptures, and in, in particular, German medieval sculptures that were carved of wood. So even though he's working with bronze, it still kind of looks wooden and stiff and, and a character almost like something from one of his plays. I love that quality of his work. But unfortunately, he's labeled a degenerate artist by the Nazis and later dies because, you know, part of this idea, a big part of his identity was attached to making art. And if you can't make art, what do you do? The next group of artists that we're going to talk about are, um, you know, the artists that we've talked to up to this point were German artists and we talk about German expressionism, but there was also an equal movement in Vienna in Austria, basically of Austria expressionism that's really, really similar to um, German Expressionism, and some of these artists also worked in Germany as well, or met some of the artists. Um, this is one of the most uh, famous artists of this period, that is an Austrian Expressionist, it's Egon Schiele. Egon Schiele died really young in 1918 from the influenza. A lot of people talk about the pandemic and Spanish flu in the United States and globally as being really similar to the pandemic that we've been experiencing re recently with COVID-19, that the amount of people that were infected from it, the, were people wearing masks, there's a lot of similarities. Chile died during that uh, influenza pandemic. He was um, really interesting as an artist. His dad didn't want him uh, to be an artist. His father um, died, uh, in, in, you know, he was mentally ill and he was raised by his uncle. There's a lot of kind of tragedy. There, there's a sense of sexuality in his work too. His works were very explicit. A lot of his works really uh, emphasize hands and also posing. He was good friends with Gustav Klimt, but instead of having very decorative works, he wasn't really interested in the decorative aspects. He was much more into the expressionistic, expressionistic like stylistically, but also emotionally. He died young, like I mentioned. He was also imprisoned uh, for months for drawing young models that was seen as being like pornography. He used his sister, professional models, and prostitutes, but more often than not, he used himself. Uh, as a model and always look at the hands with Egon Schiele, how he emphasized the hands, elongates them, creates these really interesting gestures with the hands and also kind of a sense of fragmentation and distortion. He was inspired by Matisse and Auguste Rodin as well. It's unfortunate he died so young because it would be interesting to see what he would have done during Cubism, during Surrealism, during Dadaism. Um, I'm sure his work would have been very innovative. David Bowie was a huge collector of first Der Bruck works and also German Expressionism in general, in this case, Austrian Expressionism. Uh, and he had a lot of pieces by Egon Schiele. And this album cover by David Bowie was a direct homage to Egon Schiele. This is a photograph, a self-portrait Egon Schiele took of himself. And a lot of times these photographs that he took served as models for his paintings and drawings. Really, really beautiful. Uh, the last artist that we'll talk about, another Austrian uh, artist from Vienna is um, Kokoschka. So first he lived um, in Vienna 
then he moved to Switzerland, then he moved to Germany. So you can see how these artists are really influenced by German expressionism. They really, really get lumped in together. Oscar Kokoschka has a really unique, exaggerated, noodly kind of brushwork where the brush strokes themselves become another character, another element, and really bring the figures to life. So this is a portrait of Adolf Luce, which is interesting because Adolf Luce is also an architect. So remember this whole German expressionist period, there's a lot of artists that work hand in hand with architects. And here's a quote, uh, a couple of quotes by Adolf Luce, and one of his examples of architecture on the right, which is very modernist, very progressive, trying to create a new reality, which is what all these expressionist artists were trying to do. The, the past is in flames. The world is in uh, shambles. The world is literally falling apart. Let's build a new reality. And Adolf Luce says, the artist should, all, should serve only himself, the architect, the society, which is really interesting. The artist should serve himself, the architect should serve society. At my architecture school, I taught that to develop plans from the inside to the outside, which is interesting because that's how artists like Oscar Kokoschka and others thought about their works, working from the inside out, kind of exploring the inner turmoil and then working on the way out. This is really interesting because Oscar Kokoschka, just like Emil Nolde, lived a very long life. He survived World War I. He survived World War II. And um, he had an interesting life. His wife left him. His wife, Mahler, left him. And he was so pissed. He asked a friend to create a fake wife, a prop, a mannequin that resembled his wife. And he was frustrated how she, he didn't, quite, she didn't quite look like his wife. And this is really interesting because we didn't really, we were not really seeing something like this before, but it later influences artists during surrealism. And we kind of see those same ideas of like dreams, of, of mannequins, of dolls used in artwork. And here it's kind of like a proxy. It's a metaphor for his wife, his failed marriage. And um, this woman in blue is literally a painting, not of his wife, but of that mannequin that someone had made, a doll maker fabricated a convincing substitute of his wife. Have you seen Lars? Lars, what's it, what's it called? Lars, man, I'm drawing a blank. I'm gonna have to Google it real quick. It's got Ryan Gosling in it. Lars and the real girl. Lars is played by Ryan Gosling. He has a trouble, he has trouble dating. So basically he, he, he starts dating a, a, a doll, a full life-size mannequin. Kind of reminds me of this. Really, really interesting. He was also labeled a degenerate artist. He was injured in World War I. He had a difficult time. He stopped, after a while, he just started traveling. He stopped making art. So his work, even though he lived really, really long, is kind of trapped in time and kind of that German expressionism, Austrian expressionism model or mode or modality. Really, really interesting work. Um, becomes influential, not necessarily a household name, but I think it's unfortunate. I think he should be. Uh, and, and like I said, some of these artists, like Egon Schiele, what would have they done if they would have lived a longer life? So um, be sure to write up your response. Do that. Try to keep on this same timeline. Keep to the same schedule. Watch the lecture each day. Post your response by midnight and keep going so you don't get caught further behind. It would be difficult, I think, to watch a number of these in one day uh, to keep up. Just as if we were meeting live in person, I want this class to still feel very dynamic and a discussion. I've enjoyed reading your responses. You guys have been doing a great job with your responses and engaging with the material. It's difficult for me. I'd love to have everyone here in the room talking about these things. So I still want this to feel interactive and dynamic and not static and me just talking to myself, which essentially I am doing. Um, but uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, peace out. Enjoy your Monday.